Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and behind me is the last line of defense for keeping New Orleans from flooding as a result of the Mississippi River overtopping its banks. This here is the Monon Carey Spillway, and since its construction in the 1930s, it has been used over a dozen times to lower river levels to relieve pressure on levees around New Orleans. In today's video, we're going to take a tour of the structure and the spillway itself and discuss the details of its opening, its effects on New Orleans, as well as the environment in the surrounding areas. So let's go ahead and get started. And it is way windier today than the forecast was saying. So bear with me. So if you watch my other videos in the series on flood defenses for the Mississippi River in South Louisiana, you know that the federal government created a comprehensive plan of flood control structures along the Mississippi River in Louisiana in the aftermath of the 1927 floods that devastated the southern Mississippi River Valley. Hey guys, future Mr. Klein here. So like a couple of these sections here, my microphone just died in the middle of speaking, kind of like this. It blew the Carnarvon levee south of New Orleans. Okay, so I'm having to re-record them now while I'm doing the post credit so bear with me. So because of the desperate days around Easter 1927, where the river was at the top of the levees, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had decided that rather than to build higher levees like further upstream, the best way to actually protect New Orleans was to lower the water levels at the city in order to reduce the stream flow passing by. Now this could be done by diverting floodwaters from the Mississippi River through the short distance to Lake Poncho train, which by the way is a large tidal lake that drains into the Gulf of Mexico that's on the north side of the city. Research by the Corps of Engineers determined that locations of previous levee breaches called crevasses would be the best place to construct the spillway, as in these locations the river was already trying to spill over its banks, meaning a spillway not only would easily facilitate floodwaters, but it also would provide a strong structure to protect a vulnerable section of the levee. Here at Bonnie Carey there were four such crevasses in the 19th century, including one of them in 1849 that remained open for over six months and was nearly 1.5 miles wide at the widest. So because this crevasse was not only north of the city of New Orleans, but the distance between the Mississippi River and Lake Pontchartrain was less than 10 miles, not a long distance. These reasons made this location the ideal spot to build a spillway. As diversions south of New Orleans, such as the Carnarvon crevasse, dynamited during the 1927 flood, wouldn't provide protection for the city. The spillway itself is an ingenious bit of engineering, as the trick in diverting floodwaters is to allow excess water to flow from the flooded river without encouraging an avulsion or a channel switch. For instance, the spillway's base is at a height that the only way it would accept water would be if the Mississippi River was well into its flood stage. In addition to this is the fact that the spillway is divided into a series of bays. Because there's so many bays in the spillway, 350 in fact, it means that the amount of water diverted into Lake Pontchartrain can be controlled. You could open a single bay for a small amount of water or all 350 in cases of a large flood or any number in between. The Corps of Engineers began construction in 1929, and engineers faced two large challenges in the construction. So the first one was this. The first challenge regarded the concrete that was actually necessary to build the structure. So moving water imparts large amounts of force, as well as the fact that within the river you have whole trees and other objects that are moving along underneath the surface. These impacts could damage the structure, and a failure of the spillway could allow for the river to change course at the resulting crevasse. So scientists on site developed a type of concrete that could handle up to 5,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. And at the time, this was almost double the strength of concrete that had been used for the structure. So the result is the spillway, almost 90 years after its construction, has needed little in the way of maintenance to the structure due to the durability of the concrete. The second problem is related to the structure itself. So all of this concrete is really heavy, and because the spillway is built on a swamp, the land doesn't have enough tensile strength in order to hold the structure up on its own. So without some sort of support, the spillway would just sink into the mud and eventually collapse. The solution to this was to bury thousands of pilings across where the spillway would stand to support the structure. So these two innovations, the high PSI concrete as well as the pilings, have made the spillway stand the test of time. And it's been recognized by the American Society of Civil Engineers and as a national landmark in 2017. 
So enough of the background. How does the spillway work? Well, at the time of recording, the Mississippi River is just reaching flood stage here, which means the flood fight, as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers calls it, is beginning. If you remember some of my previous videos, the trigger for the opening of the flood defenses is the flow rate of the river rather than the river height. When the flow rate at Bonnet Carry reaches 1.25 million cubic feet per second, the gates are open by the removal of needles in the bays below. The number of bays open depends on the amount of water that needs to be diverted, and this amount of diverted water can be adjusted as needed to keep the river level safe for the levees as well as for river traffic along the Mississippi. The waters flow down the five miles of marshland guarded by levees until they meet Lake Pontchartrain. So if you're traveling on Interstate 10, when the spillways in operation, you actually watch the floodwaters rush through the trees here for the last hundred meters or so, making the whole process look even more dramatic. Since the spillway opened in 1931, it's been open 14 times, and of those, it was open to full capacity five times. The last one was in 2011. Also, six of the 14 openings have actually been since 2008. 2019 was the first time the spillway was open twice in one year, and the 79 days it was in operation the second time was actually the longest the spillway had been open to relieve floodwaters since its construction. This increase in the usage of the spillway has been controversial for the environmental impact on Lake Pontchartrain. While the spillway has performed admirably in its role of relieving pressure on Mississippi River levees in the New Orleans area, the floodwaters have had an adverse impact on Lake Pontchartrain's ecosystem for several reasons. So the first one is that because the river waters are fresh water, it changes the salinity levels of the lake right here, which is brackish, the saltwater body. The waters are also cooler than the lake waters are, and these two changes affect reproduction and body functions of invertebrates that kind of hold down the ecosystem. Most damaging to the environment is all of the fertilizers dumped into the waters from farms up in the Midwest. So these fertilizers cause algae blooms in the lake, allowing toxic cyanobacteria to explode and infect organisms throughout the lake. In addition, all the algae creates dead zones because of the lack of oxygen because of these blooms in the water. As these floodwaters eventually flow through the lake and out into Mississippi Sound, the negative effects spread into those waters and into the Gulf of Mexico, harming marine life and wiping out oyster beds not just here but out in the Gulf of Mexico, devastating the seafood industry. So at the time of this recording, environmental groups were filing lawsuits against the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as well as the Mississippi River Commission, the two people who kind of manage all of this, because of what they claim to be a lack of the study of the impact on the levee on endangered species here in the lake. So there you go. Everything you could want to know about the Bonnet Carey Spillway. So in this episode, we looked at the design and the function of the structure, as well as the effects of the floodwaters that pass through here onto Lake Pontchartrain. So if anything, the spillway serves as an interesting example of the impact of man's attempts to control the environment. Now, while the city of New Orleans and the vital infrastructure for the United States is protected from flooding, through the opening of the spillway, the environmental effects can be felt long after the spillway is closed. But if there's anything in this series that I've done on flood control structures for the Mississippi River could tell you, it shows that more we try in order to limit and control Mother Nature, Mother Nature essentially shows who's in charge sooner or later. So there you go. If you have any questions, please make sure you post them in the comments below as my camera, the wind is blowing so hard, the camera's about to fall over. If you have any questions, post them in the comments below. Like more content like this, please subscribe, and thanks for watching. Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and behind me is the last line of defense from keeping New Orleans, and I can't even see it at all. Ah.